I wanted to uh, share with you a lot of, of what's going on in the body of Christ. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to I want to share with you uh, some serious things that are taking place because never before in human history, never before in human history, has the church, has the saints of God, become uh, coming under attack the way that we are today. Never before, never before. This is not the normal everyday season that, that, that Christians have experienced for thousands upon thousands. Ever since the very, very first books of the Bible were written, never before uh, has, has, have we entered a season in what we're entering right now. And, and, and so there are several things that need to be discussed and several things where we as a body of Christ and as a body of believers, we're going to have to get serious on. We're going to have to serious. We're going to have to get serious. We're going to have to come to terms. We're going to have to come to a peace and a realization. And we're going to have to be faithful and obedient and listen to the instructions as the Lord gives us as he carries out his plans in the days ahead. The first thing that I'll say is that, guys, the corporation soul here in Oregon, as you guys have known, it's under fire. Okay, you got you, we have an attempt to repeal the corporation soul law. That attempt to repeal that is a direct attack against the church itself. Not only our church, churchfreedom.org, uh, but it's against the Christian church in general. So that so you have to realize that the corporation soul. It's there to help protect Christian churches in this hour so that you are protected against what they call both gender discrimination laws and political free speech restrictions that come along with 501c3. That, that, that prohibits a pastor from speaking out against anything related to anything that, that the Holy Spirit uh, leads them to say, whether they're politically for or against a candidate that's running for office, which in this particular case is going to be very, very uh, – this is a season where, where, where that's absolutely necessary. Because there are a lot of politicians that claim to be the friends of the church. And really what they're doing is they claim to be friends of the church, but in reality you have to understand why they're saying it. They're saying that they're, they're friends of the church because they want the blessing of the church. There's nothing more that pleases a politician, a, law, a lawmaker, a political candidate running for office than going to a church and having a pastor shake their hands or put their arm around their shoulder and tell them and tell the congregation that that man or woman is a friend of the church so that they can get uh, elected, so they can get those votes, okay? Because remember, in this political democracy that we live in, this wonderful republic, you only need a 51% majority in order to win an election. So, so where are all the registered voters <laughs> that are that are registered Republican, you know, primary voters? They're in churches, and so churches aren't just a little thing. They're a battleground right now. There's a battleground for the hearts and the minds of the church itself. And so, what you're beginning to see is you're beginning to see lawmakers that say that they are friends of the church. But at the exact same time, when asked the question in relationship to uh, where they stand on issues like gay marriage, you will notice that that, then you're going to start hearing politicians that say they're friends of the church. They're going to say, well, well, I support gay marriage, or they don't support it, but they'll go to a family member's wedding that's, that's a gay wedding. And, and, and so, so that, that might work. That that type of behavior might be acceptable for a society that that doesn't know any better and that compromises because that's what lawmakers do is they compromise. That's 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 literally what they do. I've sat down with lawmakers. They can't even deny it. I've sat, I literally say I got recorded meetings with lawmakers where they say, "Well, I, I, I'm I'm a servant of Christ, but." I've taken my oath of office to serve my constituents, and not every constituent is a Christian. You see, that's that's a what a normal normal po- po- politician would say, right? But see, but see, the church doesn't have any more time for that. The body of believers that, that, that we don't have any more time for that, and so there is no compromise on this issue. 
if a person says that they support the church, then they have to be in a position to where they don't go to a family member's gay wedding because that is an act of condoning that behavior. God said that Jesus said he came here to divide. He said he didn't come here to bring peace. He said, I, I came to divide family member against family member. Those are my words. That's the testimony of the men and women, okay, or the, the brothers 2,000 years ago that wrote the four Gospels. That's what they wrote that came out of Jesus' mouth. That's not mine. That's his words. And so you have a generation right now where political leaders believe that they can say that they're friends of the church, but then at the same time turn around and say that they condone certain behaviors that the church finds abhorrent. And what makes matters even worse is that the church in general has been condoning this behavior, literally been condoning this behavior. And so then you got... Then you've got two factions in the church. You've got two primary factions. You've got your institutional, you got your inst, what I call the institutional guys. Those are your big denominations, right? And then you have, and, and, those, and, the, and the big institutional guys, the, the big institutions, like your Presbyterian churches, your United Methodists, your Lutherans, your, your big, big super denominations, okay? They are completely entrenched in 501c3 completely entrenched. They are scared out the dickens right now. And you have to realize, it's run like a corporate, like the Fortune 500 company, those churches. Those denominations are literally run like corporations, because that's what they are. They're corporations, right? So, so they've got their own board of trustees, just like if, if it was Apple Incorporated. You've got the CEO, the chairman, and then you have the board of directors, right? You have to realize it's so automated as a corporation that, like, pastors get shuffled around all around the country. Like, they'll go to a they, – they, they become pastors, and they go through the college, and they go through their, their specific college programs, and they get with their local regional overseers. And then just like job applications, they get to go to one place in the country, and they'll take, like, a pastor from Oklahoma and put him in Florida, right? And so it's, it's ran like a big business. But it's not a business. It's called a church. And, 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 those, and those churches, those big institutions – they are supposed to hold that line in check and supposed to wield that, that, that authority that God has given us to, to, to speak into the heart of the government, which has been like the, been what the church is supposed to do forever, right? And that's the whole purpose of prophets. Even in the Old Testament, they'd go before the kings, and they'd speak to the kings, right? But instead, what you have is you have this fear that's, being, uh, that's taking hold, and you have this lack of fight. And it's like they've given up ever since, ever since 501c3 was implemented. It's like the churches gave up. And so now you've got the Presbyterians, and they just accepted gay marriage. They just changed their bylaws to accept gay marriage. Now, that might not seem like it's a big deal. It might seem like, oh, well, that's just the day, right? It's just every single day that this kind of stuff happens. I mean, Paul wrote about this, you guys understand. Back in 2 Timothy, he said that the church in the latter day would have a form of godliness, but it would deny it its power. And so, and so you go to those churches, you go to those churches now, and they're dead inside. It's like a community. It's a great community. It's great to be shake hands. It's great to have it. But there's no power. There's no power. No power at all. There's no power politically. And we know that there's no power politically because I sit down with lawmakers. I physically sit down with lawmakers. I can testify, okay, that I sat down with multiple lawmakers, and lawmakers don't respect the church anymore. They don't respect it at all. And so, and so you've got a war against the church over the hearts and minds of the church that's being made by men and women in, in Washington, D.C., and you have entire flanks. If you were to look at this like a military, okay, if, we, if, we were, if, if, you, if you can imagine yourself for a moment, just imagine yourself for a moment at like you're one of those generals like during World War II. You know how they got the map out, and you, and you can see the battlefield, and you see all the enemy positions and the forces and all that kind of stuff, right? And so imagine for a moment like, like Christianity as, as a part of the battlefield. 
And when 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 the Presbyterians fall, it's like a flank that's just falling from from our from 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 our battlefield. So an entire flank just fell. And they're not they're not the only ones. The United Methodists are next. And the reason I say the United Methodists is because I get cursed out more. I get I get yelled at the most by United Methodist preachers. I get emails every time I put out an email that talks about gay marriage. I'll get an email response from some United Methodist pastor telling me that uh, we should just literally go bury our heads in the sand. We should just, like, literally leave the planet Earth because we are intolerant in saying that uh, that gay marriage shouldn't be allowed in the church and that we are furthering a satanic agenda, even though that's what the Lord specifically laid out, right? We're just following orders. And so you've got the big denominations – They've lost their political capital. They've lost their political will. They've lost all of their motivation to speak even to these lawmakers and get lawmakers to actually do anything. They haven't wielded anything. They didn't say to the lawmakers, hey, you know what? It's great that you want to shake our hands, but before you shake our hands and tell us you're a friend of the church, you're going to have to do this. They're too scared to say that because if they say that, then guess what the IRS gets to do? It gets to come into your church and audit you. Even though there's supposed to be this mythical thing I keep hearing about called the separation of church and state. There's like this, this myth I keep hearing. There's like this rumor out there in the wind that I keep hearing over and over that there's this separation. Yet immediately when a, when a, when a pastor could say the words that I just said to you, then all of a sudden out of the blue, they get audited by the Treasury Department. Now, the Treasury Department, the IRS, didn't just get that authority out of, the, out of their hat. They didn't just wake up one morning and say, you know what? We would like to go into a building with a bunch of churches, and we'd like to go ahead and, and we'd like to uh, uh, just go ahead and, and examine their books, and we'd like to just go ahead and talk, and, and, and we'd just like to go through every single facet of their life. They didn't just wake up one morning and do that. You need to realize that Congress – Okay, the friends of the church, those brothers and sisters that get elected that want to go into your church, okay, right in this political season, they want to shake your hands. Well, see, those brothers and sisters that said that they were friends of the church, they were the ones that gave the Treasury Department the authority to walk all up in your grill and train wreck your church. And then the lawmakers today, so for some reason, they hold it against the church that the church isn't stepping up for them when it's needed. Yet when we say words like this, we're immediately audited. So you've got an attack vector right now that the enemy is using that has been overwhelmingly successful. So you've got an entire flank of the Presbyterian church. They're falling. They're done. Those guys, the boys, them boys. They got gay bishops, and they got everything that's backwards and satanic that can be. And it doesn't matter whether or not they can profess in the name of Jesus. It's holy and completely, totally satanic in its nature. When you accept that, when you promote that, that is satanic in nature. You can't condone it. It can't be condoned. And then you got, so you got those institutional guys, and they're all falling away. They're falling away. They're just, they're just gone. They, and you're just seeing them right now being systematically broken up. Then you've got a remnant of brothers that have faith. And, and those, those brothers that have faith, depending on the size of their church, most of them, there's a percentage of them that absolutely love the corporation soul. They're like, like yes, this is, the, this is what we need. This is the true separation of the church and state. We, they, uh, they get it. They get that the corporation's soul isn't the church, so the church isn't incorporated, even though there are folks out there that have made claims that the corporation's soul somehow is the church being incorporated. It's not. Remember, the corporation's soul is nothing more than an office within a church. It's not the church itself. Okay, so it's not the church. It's just like an isolated office. Like if, if Apple Incorporated, okay, if Apple Incorporated was a church, then like then 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 the the Apple would be the entire church, and then like there would be an office, like a vice president, uh, the CFO, okay, and that would be the incorporation, and that person would hold the incorporation, meaning that the entire organization isn't under that law. Only the office that's within the organization is underneath the jurisdiction of that law. But, man, I'm telling you what, trying to explain this to a group of pastors, I'm going to be real. 
it's not that easy because pastors, for some reason, they're not lawmakers. They don't study law. Most of them don't. And they're out there to preach the gospel. And you're trying to get across a, a complex technical legality, you know, a technical legality. And, and most of them will get it, and most of them don't. And so you got those guys, and most of those guys, they're faith preachers or they're pastors of churches that have about 100 to 200 members, and they are deathly afraid of their board. And when it comes to the corporation's soul, it removes the power and the authority away from the board, and it places the finances in the trust of one individual within the church. And they freak out. They go, oh, my gosh. How can one person be in charge of all those finances? I am not kidding. I have sat down with trustees, and they said, well, how, how in the world could one man be trusted with any finances, even though they're literally talking about their church? And I ask them a question. I say, I say I've got to understand something. Do you take your family to church on Sunday morning to receive from your pastor? Well, yes, I do. Okay, so you trust your spiritual, you know, you, you, you are trusting to the spiritual nourishment, the teaching of the Holy Ghost coming into your life from that man of God, yet you don't trust him with $5? Can you trust your pastor with $5? Because Jesus said in Luke that if you could trust somebody with something very little, then you can trust them with something that was great. And, and, and so they can't resolve that. Because those guys that made those churches, they ended up electing, like, the richest people in the church to be their board of directors. That's what they did. That's what they did. They figured it out real quick. They figured that, you know what, we could keep the money around if we elect them to the board. Come on. It's the truth. Like I said, the Holy Ghost, thank you. I got nothing to lose and everything to gain. This is the truth. This is the stuff that nobody wants to talk about in the church. This is what nobody wants to talk about. And, folks, this is only the beginning of our problems. See, besides 501c3, remember, years ago, if you've been listening to us, years ago, even in our Empower Your Ministry meetings when we went down to California, we very much said to the church, it was on the record, that in the years to come, that, that the liberal, the, the atheist, that spirit of antichrist, it was going to use the auspice of what they call a gender discrimination law to protect the equal white rights of Americans, right? The, and, and they were going to create these laws, and these laws were engineered for one purpose only, to destroy the church entirely. They're not there to make you have a bad day. They're there to legally entrap you. And just as the Holy Spirit prophetically warned years ago, guess what? Look in the news now. You get to see it everywhere. And then they try to hide and bury the data. Because there's only like, what, six companies that own like all the news media outlets out there, right? So that's why Americans don't get a lot of their news correctly. And so they don't hear about how the Catholic Church is being sued, where, 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 where a, a choir director comes out as gay, okay, and, and, and the church fires him rightfully – and that uh, choir director ends up going out hiring an attorney, and they sue based on the gender discrimination law. And the church is co totally oblivious to what those results are because when they win the case and they'll win, then, then it becomes a common law precedent now. It becomes a common law precedent, something that like, what's that mean, right, as a pastor? What's common law precedent? Well, see, what that means, pastor, is that means when they win that case, they're going to come to your state, and they're going to sue a little church just like yours, and, and see, what they're going to do is then they're going to make it to where no church can then hire or fire anybody based on gender discrimination. That means if a transgender, a man comes up dressed like a woman, and he's got the Adam's apple, but he's taking the shots and he's coming in there all correct, right? You got to understand, you can't turn them away and say, no, I'm sorry, that's just not the type of behavior we're going to be hiring here at, in God's house, right? You put out a, you put out an ad in the, in the, in the, in the newspaper, you need, you need to hire a choir director. Well, guess what? You're not going to be able to hire based on those preferences anymore because they're suing based on gender laws that you didn't even know was even happening. Didn't even know was happening. Then, then you got gay marriage. You got gay marriage. So now, so now, you, you as a pastor, see, pastors and churches, when they, when they get to churches, they like to rent out their facilities to weddings, right, for Christian weddings. Every single church in America does it. That's a part of how they keep their pay their bills. 
Okay, let's just keep it real. This out. There's not a lot of people tithing to churches these days. Let's put it that way. All right. So one of the ways that the churches, uh, it, it, the, the storehouse remains full, is that they'll conduct weddings within the churches. This is a normal. This is every. This is like since the beginning of time. All right. This is taking place. But see, now under gender law, under the gender discrimination law, I don't care if they donate a dollar to your ministry, a dollar, and say, well, here, pastor, I'd like to give you a dollar, and I'd like to rent out this facility, okay? If you rent out that that facility for a dollar to a straight couple, and you didn't rent it out to a gay couple that comes in immediately after you, and if you don't do that immediately after they come after you, okay, then you need to realize you are in violation of a gender discrimination law. Now, see, the church thinks, oh, we'll protect ourselves by creating these things called religious freedom laws, right? They say, well, we'll, we'll create religious freedom laws, and those religious freedom laws, they'll help protect us against those things. Well, as you can clearly see, it's not Democratic governors that are vetoing religious freedom laws. It's Republican. It's Republican. Okay? So, so it's Republican governors, not Democratic governors. It's Republican governors vetoing because it's bad for business. And see, what it comes down to is it comes down to the mighty dollar. You know, nobody wants to mess up them, that money flow, right, which, which is really interesting because, because that's only going to last just not too much longer. Just look at Wall Street. Like we said weeks ago, if high-frequency trading was suspended, okay, if they banned it tonight, tomorrow they'd have to suspend day trading on the, uh, on the stock exchange. They'd have to literally shut it down. The economy would collapse overnight. So there's no more money. This is, a, this is, this is all a sham. This is like a big charade of imagination we're all playing out right now. Your dollar bills are about as about as valuable as this camouflage hat that I'm wearing <laughs> that I'm holding right now in my hand. That's about how worthless it is. Okay, so so the Republican governors are vetoing these religious freedom laws. So you don't have any protection there. So you don't have any protection with religious freedom. You don't got any of that. You can't hire anybody now. You can't rent out your facilities. Boy, guess what, church? You're done. Church is done. What can you do then legally? What can you legally do? And then, then I hear it. Then I hear it. Then I hear it. And then when we say the corporation soul is out there, it's out there, we will freely help you, freely be a blessing. You want to know what I get in return? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you plainly. I got institutional guys in that play devil's advocate with me and say, well, well what if we threw in a bunch of hoops? And we made it really, really terrible for them, and and we did all these things to make it really aggravating and so that they wouldn't even want to come to the church. Well, not only will that technique not work, because that's clearly not what the enemy's doing right now. They're on a full frontal assault against Christianity right now. Not only will that technique not work, it still doesn't resolve absolutely anything. But then I hear words, but then they start speaking proud, and they say, well, we're just going to hold our ground. We're going to hold our ground. We're going to put the line in the sand. We are not going to give in. Corporation soul are not. Okay? And then they give me every excuse why they can't get it. They give me every excuse why they can't get the corporation soul, even though it's there, right there for them to be protected. Okay? And then they tell me why they can't get it, even though it's literally sitting right there for free, right there for the body of Christ to play devil's advocate. And so you have to realize that there is no words. It's, it's, it's like somebody that has a worn out for the rest. Well, they can draw a line in the sand, and they can say, well, I'm, I'm not giving up. Well, those are valiant words. Those are very courageous words, but it still won't stop those 20 men from kicking down your door and taking you away. And let me explain something to you. That's what's happening that's why we post on Church Freedom that they just passed an ordinance in, 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 in Idaho where now if a, if, a, if a pastor does not accept gay marriage, you under the Idaho's ordinance of gender discrimination can now go to jail for 180 days. This is in addition to the little mundane laws that they're passing everywhere like you can't feed the homeless without a permit. 
So now you can't feed the homeless without a permit. So see, you can't feed the homeless without a permit. You can't have church in your house without a permit or you'll go to jail, just like the pastor did down in Arizona. You can't, so let's see, you can't have church in your house like you used to. You can't go out there and feed the helpless on the streets like you used to without your state government-sponsored permit, right? You can't hire and fire who you wanted to, and you can't rent out your, 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 your sanctuary right now to anyone unless you include gays. So gotta, you gotta, and you can't speak out against any, for or against any political candidate for office. So I've got to ask the church a question. What can you do? But see, you can't you can't endorse anybody. You can't you can't influence government policy in any way, shape, or form. You can't hold church at your house. You can't feed the homeless. You can't rent out the facilities, and you can't even hire and fire who you want. And you sure as heck can't even go get. You couldn't even get the church couldn't even get a religious freedom law passed in a Republican majority state. So you have to tell me what left does the church have? What do you got left? You see. See, the corporation sold this out there, but see, see, the thing about it is, is that, see, 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 I've, 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 I've stood this ground here. The Holy Ghost has led this fight. We've tried our hardest. We made it available. Even when God told us to make the corporation sold stuff for free and said, put no limitation on it, then knowing in advance that pastors – very, very, very few of them ever reciprocate anything back in return. Let me, let me break that down for you. So that means I'm not allowed to conduct business right now. I pleaded with the Lord. I have pleaded with him. I said, Lord, please, three times I've pleaded with God. He has not released me. He has not released me. And we put it out there for everybody. Even the state says that there is 175 plus corporation souls that, that have been filed here in Oregon just within the last two years alone. Sixty-five percent of the corporate souls here in the state of Oregon had to register through our church. I say that the vast, vast majority of them were, were registered through our church. Very, very few donate absolutely anything. You want to know how many volunteers? You want to know how many applicants from pastors? That, that say that they would like to come and get what we have, absolutely no cost, no question whatsoever, that say to me on an application that they will volunteer in return because they're getting something that the equivalent is about $15,000. That's what everybody in God's creation was selling corporations all those tax shelters for, right? You couldn't even go out and get a registered agent in the state of Oregon because registered agents in the state of Oregon won't even take on corporations all because they fear that they're, gonna, they're a high risk for tax fraud. So they can't even go around me. And trust me, I've had 500 pastors try, and they keep coming back, right? So they can't even do that. And out of all those pastors that said they'd volunteer, out of the hundreds upon hundreds, you want to know how many did? Two. I can name them right off the top of my head, but I won't. Two of them. Two out of hundreds. You wonder why we can't get anything done in the body? But see, this is only the beginning. So the church can't influence public policy. You can't hire and fire anybody like you used to. You can't rent out your facilities. You can't feed the homeless. And you can't have church at home anymore. And then when a brother comes out, when the church comes out and offers it to you for free, nothing is even reciprocated. Very, very little is reciprocated in return. Now I've had to live off faith. Now I've had to live off faith. My wife and I, the church here, we've had to live off faith. I mean live off faith. You see, when I say live off faith, see, I'm not talking about some superficial live off faith. Now, I'm not talking about, like, we're living off faith and just, man, being every day in No, 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 no. We ain't talking about that. We're talking about God saying, fill up your storehouse, and he leads me out to, like, a, a, a lake, and, 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 and fish start swimming up to the shore so I can pick them up with my bare hands and take them home because I have nothing faith. So these words, they're kind of important because we're living out a Bible story over here. We got testimony, Bible story testimony. 
The Holy Ghost is glorified. He said, I were protected, set apart every need we have as men. And he has fulfilled that even in the face where it doesn't even make sense whatsoever. And so you got to realize we've been, we've been here at the forefront. And the corporation, so technically speaking, represents the last legal line of defense for Christians in the United States of America. And right now, even with it being repealed, okay, we receive very, very little support in any way, shape, or form in getting this done and getting this mission out. And you want to know the worst part is that the message that God is placing on my heart right now isn't even about the corporation's soul anymore. Oh, no. See, he's putting on my heart something else. See, besides you legally, besides the church legally being outmaneuvered in every single category possible, okay, there are other things. So where where the pastors didn't even see that their enemy was there, even though it was spoken, it was spoken. This isn't like God didn't warn the church. No, we warned the church years ago. It was prophetic words. There is physical proof that prophetic words got out. Now, it's not my fault that it didn't get on TBN. It's not my fault that it didn't get on Charisma magazine. It's not my fault for it didn't get any there, anywhere there. We ask pastors to help us get the word out. Uh, very, very, very few pastors wanted to actually help get that word out, and the few that did were very effective. But the majority didn't want to. They're either too scared or too something or too busy or too whatever, okay? And so, and so it didn't get a lot of traction. And so now, now when, when the church had a chance two years ago to, to correct this mistake, they didn't take it. And so now we, the church gets to reap the benefit of not doing that. And actually, they get to reap the disaster now. And that's what you're seeing right now in this country. You are seeing the church being legally dismantled. And that, friends, is only, my brothers and sisters, the beginning. That is only the beginning of what's coming. Because then God had another message. And he put it out on January the 25th. And this is a message that God had me hold in for the better half of close to two years. And it dealt with artificial intelligence. And I'm going to tell you plainly, I'm going to tell you plainly, if it wasn't for the fact that God himself showed this to me, and it wasn't for the fact that I physically was in his presence when he actually showed me this, and I can tell you as your brother in Christ with confidence that I have stood in the presence of the Lord and have seen incomprehensible glory that I can't even describe to you by looking into his face and him actually showing me this. I, she told me, he commanded me that I wasn't allowed to say I understood. I can only say I was allowed to observe. But he allowed me to observe something being built. And it had to deal with AI. It had to deal with artificial intelligence. And I'm going to tell you right now. If it wasn't for the fact that he led me after he gave me that revelation to the proper places so that it can give you the physical proof necessary to warn you, I would have thought myself was crazy. If it wasn't for Holy Ghost revelation, I would have been like, oh, my gosh, what in the world is this brother talking about? So put out a word. God finally released a word on January the 25th. I might ask you to make your phone, but so God gives a word on January. He gives a word on January the 25th related to artificial intelligence. Wow, as crazy as that sounds, there's a word on our website, Church Freedom. It's right down there on the right-hand side of the page. You scroll down past the copy of the free corporation's old book that you can download. It's right there for everybody to download. And right beneath that, it says uh, Church Freedom, I think, recent articles. And you'll go down there, and you're going to see something called testimony, a testimony regarding an immediate threat to the body of Christ. So besides the church being completely unaware of the legal threat against it, now it is completely oblivious to the machine intelligence threat that's right in front of us. And so there has been a machine intelligence that's literally been built right underneath of our noses here. You don't have to take my word for it. It's right there on the page. 
you can go and scroll. That's the, there's a reason why the Holy Spirit uh, told me to use reputable website links, that, not to conspiracy websites. We ain't talking about these websites that are out there like the, the, that you know what I'm talking about, the right-wing websites, and it's kind of like before it's news.com. And I don't want to disrespect news agencies, but there are websites out there that are, that, 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 that are very fear-based, and they're meant to freak you out. And see, God's trying to give you a word of instruction right now without you being freaked out and without you getting a spirit of fear. Because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He gives us proper instructions. So see, when a prophet speaks, remember, a prophet is supposed to be a messenger of God. See, a prophet doesn't just, like, walk around trying to quote scripture, telling people what, 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 what they think the time and season. No, see, a prophet is a messenger of God. That means they're like God's FedEx man. We're not here to discuss your package. We're not here to judge whether or not you enjoy the contents of this box that you were handed, or whether you like it or whether or not. We're just here to deliver the message. We're completely emotionally indifferent to the message. We're just here to relay the message. It's nothing personal. My feelings, my personal emotions are absolutely secondary, totally secondary. That's what the role of a prophet is supposed to do, is to deliver the hard messages, whether they're good or whether they're bad. doesn't matter whether they're inconvenient or not. That's what the role of a, of, of a messenger is supposed to do. So, so you've got this message, and it's telling you, first off, don't freak out. Have peace. This isn't meant to give you fear. This is meant to prepare you. So like lambs to the slaughterhouse, you're not militarily caught off guard. Because, see, the church has already had a hard time trying to figure out its enemy legally. See, couldn't even figure that out, let alone something as high-tech as machine intelligence. And I know the church has already had a hard time with that because most of our emails are from pastors are from pastors that have very technical difficulties even resetting their password when we have a video on our website and a button that says reset password. So we know that the majority of our brothers and sisters are not technologically experts in the IT field. We know that our brothers and sisters, we're not experts. We're just not. We're, we, 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 we're pastors. We want to go out there. We want to help the lost. We want to save the lost. We want to take care of the widows and the, and the orphans. That's our calling, right? Men and women of God, you are under a direct military threat right now. And our government has built a machine of unparalleled power, unparalleled military might. There is a very specific reason why President Obama is engaging Syria and he is engaging Russia right now. You need to understand, there's a very specific reason why. There's a reason why it says that the beast in Revelation would be unparalleled in military strength. And so January 25th, there's a word about machine intelligence. And it said, it said right there, it said there are going to be some things that are going to end up happening with quantum computing, the living cell, and artificial intelligence. All three of those would combine. They would combine all three of those attributes. And you were given advance notice to what the Bible refers to as an abomination that causes desolation. What does it mean to even be desolate? To be completely void of life, right? But there were some things that needed to happen. There were some breakthroughs that needed to happen. That word was given out January the 25th. Okay. After that word was given out, there was a $250 million no-bid federal defense contract. Like I said, you don't have to take my words for it. You don't have to listen to Joshua King Greenwood it's just in case there are brothers out there like, oh, this young guy, what does he know? Go to the website, and it's right there where you can read it from the defense industry yourself. There's a $250 million contract that was given to Raytheon, IBM's, uh, Watson's Division, and Cryogenic Computing, which is a member of the IARPA. Those are – the IARPA is a direct uh, – they're under the Director of National Intelligence and DARPA. They're the agency, uh, the defense agency within our federal government that is responsible for building the machine intelligence that is codenamed Acquaint. Four websites in the whole world have written about it. Four. 
Number one was back in 2006, and it had to deal with James Bramford. Just in case you don't know who James Bramford is, James Bramford is one of those Edward Snowden guys. He's one of those reporters. He's a defense intelligence reporter. He he reports on things related to the NSA. He's the most well-respected NSA intelligence reporter on the planet. We're talking the Pulitzer Prize winning brothers. Okay, These are my words. Those were his words. He was the very, very first one to report on this. Then the second one was Business Insider. Business Insider is a very reputable website, but you know what they did? All they did was they plagiarized the first story from the first article. And then the Washington Post came out, and the Washington Post reported on it. And they took the original article from, from, from <laughs> that was copied from the NOVA and the PBS article that James Bramford originally wrote, and then they took that and they took it and combined it with the Business Week, and they put their own spin on it. And so Washington Post was the third website. We were the fourth and the final one. No one else has posted anything about a quaint. That's its name, by the way, a quaint. That's its code name. It's an acronym. I can't pronounce it right now. It's on the website. You can figure it out. Now, since, since we've reported on that, you need to know what's actually happened because it was reported to you that they would make, they would make significant progress in both artificial intelligence, uh, the living cell, and quantum computing. Okay, get this. Since we reported that, guess what's ended up happening? All three things have ended up happening. Number one, they ended up making a, uh, they ended up creating a breakthrough with superconducting supercomputing, which just in case you don't know what that is, that brings supercomputing to a completely new level. That means where they used to be able to, to, to have like hard drives that would run processes in petaflops. Now they'll be able to run it in exaflops and greater. That means they will be able to calculate what would normally take the life age of the universe for a normal computer to begin calculating. These superconducting supercomputers can calculate it in less time it would take you to make a cup of coffee. They made a $250 million no-bid contract that day that the professors, I believe, at MIT, when they, when they made the discovery, that day they had a $250 million contract. Then they created a $700 million contract no less than two months ago, the same company, Raytheon, that's helping to develop this. Okay, to go ahead and put all the communication equipment back in NORAD the same day that there was a blackout in Washington, D.C., just in case you all forgot about that. Well, that happened, and it's all related to one another, just because you didn't know what was going on. Then, this week, they just made a complete advancement in quantum computing. Quantum computing. So we're pastors. We don't even know about gender discrimination laws, and then here we're talking about quantum computing. How in the world... Does that help out anything, right? How do, what does that have to do with the church? It has to do with the church because you're going to be hunted with these weapons. You're going to be hunted with them. They're going to take those weapons and they're going to use it against you, just like they're using the gender laws against you. They're going to use these autonomous weapons against you as Christians, just in case you didn't know where this was going. You're about to be hunted to extinction, men and women of faith. Oh, I'm not saying this to, to speak fear. That's what your Bible says. That's what our Bible says. It says, and the beast would make war against the saints, and he would conquer them. That's what the word says. Go look any translation up. It's right there in Revelation. It says it is plain as Jane. Right there, he would make war against the saints, against God's holy people. That's you and me, and he would conquer them. Which also means that the enemy looks at you as a military fighting force. What you haven't even realized yet is that evangelical Christians are already registered with the Department of Homeland Security as an extreme threat. So they look at you as an extreme threat. They're taking away every right that you have away as a Christian. Okay? We're condoning behavior in the Middle East that's leading to our brothers and sisters being beheaded everywhere. Just like our brother John told us would happen, okay, then you have this machine intelligence that the Holy Spirit is warning you and saying, that's it. That's why Jesus, that's why Jesus said, let the reader understand. Because it would have been kind of weird for Jesus to say 2,000 years ago, by the way, guys, you're going to have an abomination that causes desolation. You're going to have a machine intelligence that's going to hunt you to total desolation. If I didn't shorten the days, that no life on earth would even be existing. See, it's, it, it, for his audience, they probably wouldn't have gotten that. So he was good enough and he was kind enough to say, let the reader understand. 
so that in this day and age, we knew what the threat was that was coming against us. So then you've got the you've got superconducting supercomputing that just had a breakthrough. You've got the quantum processors that just got an enormous breakthrough with what they call electron superposition with qubits. Now, that's like a really big sentence, right? It's like, what in the universe did that brother just say? That means electron superposition. It kind of like if you were to think in binary where, 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 where one, you know, your computer reads a code, a source code, and it's in ones and zeros. Okay. We'll see with a quantum computer, they don't read things in ones and zeros. They read it in a, in a qubit with electron superposition, so one is a zero at the same time. So they're able to calculate at absolutely fantastic processing speeds that are beyond anything that any computer on the planet Earth can process. In fact, just like we've reported on our website, there's not a single bit of encryption on the planet left after quantum computing is revealed that will even be able to stop a quantum computer from breaking every single form of encryption that's on the planet Earth. So the Christians that still got it in their brains, just like the ones that say they don't need the corporate soul, and just like the ones that say they're going to hold their ground, they say, well, well, we'll get encrypted cell phones, and we'll get encrypted computers, and we'll just outsmart this machine. No, you can't outsmart it. That's a thousand in your brain, you're being sold a bad bill of goods. If you buy an encrypted cell phone thinking that that's going to help encrypt your phone communications, <laughs> not only are you not uh, correct in that assessment, not only have you, if, if, has it failed miserably in that assessment, you are completely and totally wide open right now. And that's in addition to the fact that irregardless of what a federal appeals court said today about NSA spying, they never stopped it. They never ordered a court order to stop it. So today, you, you can't even expect that you even have privacy. You can't even expect that the authorities are going to respect your constitutional rights of privacy. And they put this all into a database. Then we revealed on there Project Babel from the IARPA, where they will take uh, everything that's being said over a telephone and be able to transcribe it in real time. And guess what? Three days ago, the Edward Snowden guys over there at FirstLook.org, they went ahead and they reported on it that the NSA has the technology to do this. We reported on that back in January. But see, it was codenamed Project Babel that you didn't even know existed. And then, uh, two months ago, DARPA, the agency that owns the machine intelligence acquaint, they're the ones that built it, okay, created... A, an algorithm that mimics the living cell. Now, why is that important? Because, see, your living cells, everything that's inside of your body has a natural immune system response. It's always on the fight. It's always on the go. You get a cut. You get a little small paper cut. In 24 hours, your body repairs itself. Well, see, that's really important to a machine intelligence. That's really, really important when it comes to nanotechnology and what it's able to do at a nanoscale. And trust me, folks, just in case you didn't know what's going on at a nanoscale, they can now edit your genome sequences. They can even deliver drugs and prescription medication through nanotechnology right now. Just in case you didn't know how fast and far advanced nanotechnology was. It's so, so, so you've got a machine that's now understanding and running an algorithm to understand how to survive in any environment just like the living cell does. That's why we find the living cell in every environment on the planet. That was very important, and that also fulfills biblical prophecy because it says one of the heads of the beast would be wounded, but it would be healed again. It would be healed again. And it just kind of went right over our heads that that would even be possible. We were sitting here thinking, I got old church brothers that think that there's an actual dragon, like a physical, like, like Godzilla is going to come out of the sea. And it never dawned on them that when John was trying to write about the sea, he wasn't talking about the actual sea with water. He talked about the sea of information that came from the Internet. Because back 2,000 years ago, men used to stare out at the sea, and they used to see in deep contemplation. They'd seek the knowledge and the wisdom of God by looking out there at the sea. And so that brother had no point of reference to even say Internet because the Internet hadn't even been invented yet. And so you've got this machine intelligence, and they have, they're perfecting quantum computing, they're perfecting the living cell, and they have already been perfecting machine artificial intelligence. That's why up in New York City, the Watson supercomputer, the Watson, the machine learning Watson, the one that beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy, it's now taking over all of the cancer therapies at 14 different hospitals. 
So all their thousands of patients to individualize treatment from a machine intelligence. And then we put out an email related to the, 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 the Navy, the Navy that puts out their brand new locust. That's literally what it's called. It's called locust. I kid you not. You couldn't even make this stuff up. And they put out this machine, and it's called Locus, and it's a low-cost uh, uh, autonomous drone, attack drone, right? And so, and so you go to our website, go to Church Freedom, and there's a page there talking about Locus. Okay? And so the Navy develops this autonomous AI kill bot. And so you've got to understand what autonomous means. You see, when you see those predator drones and you see all those drones flying around, okay, those are flown with human operators, they have men down in Nevada sitting inside of a little, uh, a, a, a little storage container that's like uh, uh, macked out with uh, electronic equipment and communications equipment, and they steer those predator drones from within those little boxes, just like you see in the movies, right? Okay, autonomous means that there's no human operator. That means there is an artificial machine intelligence and it is making a personal decision on whether or not to kill that individual. It's making the decision. It doesn't go back to home base. It doesn't report back. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't say commander is this the kill order. It makes the decision. It has an algorithm that determines when it goes into that kill zone on what to kill. And you get to watch a video by the U.S. Navy. Then you got a bunch of American brothers and sisters go, yeah, woo, that's our Navy. Right on, our taxpaying dollars at work. And it never dawned on the church that, gee, somehow, some way, those, those weapons would be used against you. They never contemplated, never contemplated that, that with a billion-dollar budget that the Defense Department – with 3D printing, with industrial military 3D printers, could be fabricating thousands upon thousands of legions of these drones. We have an unstoppable fighting force. And they got lives on the heart about the, about the drones and about the, the 3D printers. So then you've got a whole new classification coming out. Then you've got new inventions that just somehow came out of the blue, where now the U.S. Defense Department can now turn ocean water into usable jet fuel. So now we've created – now, see, remember, these are my words. You don't have to take my word for it. That's why it's right there on the website. So you can click the link, and you can go to the Defense Department's website, and you can verify it from them. You just didn't know it existed. And so, and so you've got these industrial military 3D printers. They're not like your 3D printers like at home where you print out like a little you know, doll or something or a little, you know, little design that you create on AutoCAD. These, these three industrial 3D printers, they're, they're like the size of houses. And see, what they're printing out are autonomous warships, autonomous drones, autonomous stealth fighter drones, autonomous reconnaissance stealth um, – we're talking about uh, fighter-to-fighter -fighter drones. We're talking about autonomous stealth fighters that can go in like a stealth bomber and just bomb any random target that they want, and locusts. And then you have underwater uh, autonomous AI machine intelligence-driven uh, 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 submarine torpedoes that can literally sit there and float on the ocean floor and then pop out of the water and fly to any target, and they attack in a swarm. Sins of God, even if a country were to attempt to vaporize and nuke America, and they will, okay, you need to understand that with this 3D printing technology, this machine intelligence can literally print out any resource it wants as fast as it wants in every capacity available from the sea, the land, to the air. And you didn't even know that this was being built right underneath of your 
noses. And that's only the beginning. That's a part of the weapon system that will be hunting you. And no one bothered to ask the question, a very, very simple question. Was artificial machine intelligence incorporated into our government's continuity of government plan? And just in case you don't know what a continuity of government plan is, that means if Russia were to vaporize Washington, D.C. right now, and took out the Joint Chiefs of Staff, took out the President, the Vice President, the, the, the Secretary of State, and took out everything in an overwhelming, devastating attack. No one ever bothered to ask the question about whether or not this autonomous machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, had been incorporated into the continuity of government plan. But we know for a fact that it will be given authority and power for three and a half years, which is just shy of a presidential four-year term. But we never – with that, this kind of like flew right over our heads because we're so busy trying to defend marriage here, which we're losing every single front, that we're not seeing the bigger picture that's in play. So Wall Street's crash, everything that's going on there is an illusion – Okay, it's all done on quantitative easing, so they printed the money, okay, and then when they didn't print any money, then the, then the ECB, the European Central Bank, it printed money, and if they can't print money, Japan prints money, and if Japan doesn't print money, China prints money to keep that charade going. And so all those companies had their asset buyback, so Wall Street's done. You've got a military threat. And you're legally been outmaneuvered on every single solitary front with the exception of the corporation. So, and they're now repealing that. And that's just, like I said, the beginning. Then we'll talk about the stewardship of the planet Earth. Then let's talk about how God right now is removing 90% of all organic life off the planet Earth right now. Once again, though, you don't have to take my word for it. Go to the website. There's a picture on there, on our link, that says stewardship of the planet Earth. And I took the picture when I was up in the woods because every time I've been brought out to the wilderness to go talk with God, every time I'm seeing this green fungus that's on all the trees, and this green fungus that's on the trees utterly destroys those trees near instantaneously. In fact, the trees die so fast that they still stand up. They're like toothpicks out in the forest. I've taken pictures with my own camera with these things. And I asked the Lord for revelation on it. And you know what he tells me? He, tell, he starts showing me all this stuff about the living cell and how the pH balance has been changed in water. And now the pH balance is becoming more acidic in water, and it's devastating life. And he is removing life off the planet Earth right now. So not only is our wilderness being destroyed, in fact, it's in the water. You can do a Google image search. You can do Google image search. Go to Central Oregon because there's these cloud formations that always form up, up and down the Cascade Mountains. And you can look on the back end of the Cascade Mountains towards the west, towards the Pacific Ocean, and you can physically see with your own eyes by doing a Google image search. And you can go right there on the Google Maps right in real time, and you blow it up forward that satellite photograph all the way down to those trees, and you will physically see with your own eyes the devastation that's taking place. Everything, everywhere that you see that's kind of white, those are from all the dead trees. And then God starts showing me how life is being removed. Did you know on the East Coast, they're not even hardly giving out any more hunting permits because the deer populations are all dying from a mysterious illness. The moose, the caribou, the salmon up in Alaska, they're all dying. They're all dying. The bees, the honeybees are dying. The monarch butterflies, 90% of them have become extinct just within the last year. Just within the last year. From the last three years, 90% of the monarch butterflies have died. 1,500 sea lions washed up in, in – oh, that's not – that was just three days ago. 20 million 
birds have died within the last four days in Iowa alone. There is a 100 mile of what they call a dead zone now that's being formed in the Atlantic Ocean where fish literally go into it and they suffocate and die. Christians want to know what to invest in. I've heard Christians, pastors say invest in like Iraqi dinars and the global economy is going to reset itself. Not only is the global economy not going to reset itself, and not only is it not going to happen with the Iraqi dinars, if you are a Christian man or woman listening to this phone call, I ask the Lord plainly, Lord, what do we do in this season? And he said, invest in life. So in case you haven't done so yet, if God gives you any resources at all right now, at this moment, if he grants you the ability to go get a credit card and you can go spend money on anything, go buy a milking cow. Don't delay. Go buy chickens. Buy a dairy cow. If you can't buy a pregnant dairy cow, if you can, buy it. Because cows can eat a lot. They can eat cheap. They eat cheap grass because their stomachs, they got, they're like, they got two stomachs. And their stomachs can handle that, okay? But you better get that because what is mankind going to do when interstate commerce ceases in this country? Because your book, the, our book, the Revelation, it says that there will be a time when a pound of wheat would be worth a day's wages. That's called hyperinflation. That's where we're headed as a country because we're all financially broke here. We have leveraged ourselves so many hundreds of percent of what we could actually borrow that we are financially bankrupt as a nation. It's literally a charade that's playing out right now. It's a charade. Nobody should be in the stock market right now. Nobody. It's totally a rigged complex. It's totally rigged. So, so, those saints, those saints that not only didn't consider the gender discrimination laws, didn't consider the threat of the military threat of machine intelligence, and now all life is being removed right out from underneath of our noses. And go on our website and literally look on the stewardship of the planet Earth and scroll down and then click on where it says 2015 mass deaths. And we've even updated for today, for even today's headlines that you don't even get to read because they don't post this stuff on Fox News. They don't post it on the New York Times. They don't post it anywhere like that. You got it. The, the data is buried. They bury the data. And so you got to go out there and search for it. And praise the Lord, there are brothers and sisters out there that do search for it in their legitimate news websites, and we post it right here on our website, the legitimate links. You can look it up, and look how much life is being removed off the planet Earth right now. And no one asked the question, what do we do when interstate commerce ceases to exist? How do you get the food? There are more people that live in a populated area in a metropolis city than there are natural resources to sustain that population. So then they say to themselves, well, here's what we'll do, Jack. We'll go and hunt. We'll go hunt deer. We'll go hunt elk. We'll go fish. But see, the problem is, is that you and 50,000 other people are all going to be thinking the exact same thing. How long since the deer populations are dwindling so significantly that they're restricting hunting season passes now throughout the United States of America, how long is it before every single one of those deers is hunted to extinction? It'll take less than eight to ten months because you're going to have every good old boy hillbilly out there in Timbuktu that's a third to fourth generation a sniper shot that's been hunting with their daddy's 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 granddaddy, okay, and you've got that lineage, and they're all going to go out there, and they're going to feed their family so that they don't starve to death. So that they don't starve to death. If you invested in anything, if you put any money in absolutely anything right now, you need to put it in life because mankind's about to starve to death, literally starve to death. And then again, those are just my words. That's your, our own Bible, 
that specifically says that this will end up happening. God never contradicts himself. And for those saints that say, this isn't the season, it's, well, Josh, this is kingdom time. It's not the end. The rapture will happen. None of this will ever happen. We will, we'll be long gone for all that happens. We'll, I'm going to tell you something. That's not what the Spirit of the Lord told me. He's not been telling me to prepare saints for, to get a ride up out of here so that they wouldn't have to do this. He's very specifically giving me a message to give to you so that you can prepare your households for when it goes down and you're not caught off guard. He didn't tell me anything about we're all going to just go up and we're going to avoid this conflict. It's not what he showed me at all. He showed me we're going to ride all up in it. We're, going, we're, we're in it to win it. And you need to know as a saint of God, as one of the elect, that God does not contradict himself. You have a war against Christianity on every single solitary front. Legally, economically, we can't say that it's not economically, because just like Melissa's cake, that got fined $135,000 here in the state of Oregon with a trial without jury in a special court that they appointed, that they had to pay that out of their own pocket of spent, uh, out of their own out-of-pocket expenses. And then when they tried to go to do a GoFundMe campaign, the GoFundMe shut down their campaign because they said it was discriminatory in nature. So you got to fight against you legally. you got to fight against you economically. And then you've got a weapon that's about to be used against you militarily. And then for food, food's being removed off the planet Earth. This is not like a normal season. And just in case you didn't feel like it was that season, then God reminded me of a prophecy in Revelation I had honestly completely forgot about. I didn't. I had totally flew right over my head, and it flew right over the thousands upon thousands of other pastors' heads that I'm connected with because none of them reported to me anything even related to this. And I know if they're not reporting it, they didn't get it, and I didn't get it, so we were all in the dark. But then a couple of weeks ago, God, the Holy Ghost, tells me to look up on a Google search River Euphrates drought because there's a prophecy in, in Revelation that the River Euphrates has to dry up. It has to dry up to make way for the kings of the east that would come forth. That's China, by the way. That, that, that old scripture about they'd come across with 200 million, you know, uh, a strong army to kill a one-third of mankind. There's no army on the planet Earth that can muster that type of military force other than China. And they've got it. And by the way, they're on the move. They're on the move. And so the Holy Spirit inspired me to look that up. And I looked it up. Come to find out, I didn't even realize this, but the river Euphrates has been undergoing a drought. You know how they have a drought in California? Well, that's a whole other topic. Then you've got California that says, NASA says they're going to run out of water within one year. And whatever water they have left in their aquifers, it's poisoned because the hydraulic fracking companies that went through there dumped all their toxic water back into the aquifers. So the little water that they even have left is poisonous. Oh, now we're not even talking about Lake Mead that feeds Nevada and New Mexico. And get this, Lake Mead, it's down to 1,075 feet as of today. Do you want to know how far it's got to keep going down before the intake valve, before the water actually goes below the intake valve so it can't even pump the water? It's like 1,050 feet. So it's only got a few more feet to go, and they say that by January 2016, it will be below the threshold, which means they aren't even going to have enough water in Lake Mead. It's going to be below the, the pumps, so they're not even going to be able to pump the water to Nevada and New Mexico. And that's on top of the fact that California has a little bit less than a year left of water because they're undergoing a severe drought. What is all the 50 million Americans that live in that area, where are they going to drink? Where are they going to eat? 12 million trees have died just within the last few months from the drought in California. So you got California 
that's going through this. You've got the southern states, but then we got this river Euphrates, and it's been undergoing a drought just like California, just like California. So, so, so the drought in, in the river Euphrates has literally dried it up. It's bone dry. It's been undergoing a severe drought since 2009. It's 2015. They've been undergoing an extreme drought. Back in 2009, the New York Times took a photograph of a person in the middle of, 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 of the River Euphrates, and it was all crusted and brown. There is a picture of it on our website that you can look at today. It's dry. Guess what? As a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, it is fulfilling itself right before you and I, our very eyes, right now. This isn't a normal day. This isn't normal. This is not normal. It is not my job, and it is not the job of other saints in this hour to teach you how to fight. That is not what we're here to do. Because there are certain saints out there, they feel like their 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 stuff is threatened, and and like when the Supreme Court you know makes their decision on gay marriage and in favor of it, you know they're going to go you know they're going to get a little bit hot under the collar, and that's going to give them the excuse that they need to go out there and raise up arms or do whatever they're going to do as good old boys. Okay, that is not the season. This is an enemy you cannot defeat militarily. You can't defeat that. You can't. So it is our job right now to teach you how to evade, not to engage. So the Holy Spirit has to then teach you how to evade, which means you better be ready to pivot. Be ready to get out of your house. You live in your home. You live in your home. You have been secured in your possessions. Be prepared at a moment's notice that God's going to tell you to get out of that city. Be prepared. Be prepared. You need to mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually begin preparing yourself. Your world is about to be completely and totally, totally changed. The plans you got, well, I'm going to do this in ministry, and six months from now, we're going to build this facility, and it's going to be like that. We're going to win. No, 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 no. That's not your destiny anymore. It might be in your brain. God's going to wreck your plans. He's going to wreck it. You need to be prepared to pivot. You need to be prepared to evade an enemy that you didn't even know existed. And so there was a specific word of instruction that has been given to the body of Christ, and it was done on March the 19th, 2015. And it was a, it's a long message. It wasn't definitely not for the faint of heart either. That was a strong word, buddy. Woo! I lost some friends on Facebook after I read, after a guy had me preach that. And folks don't understand that that word didn't come from Joshua Kenny Green. It didn't come because I felt a certain way. It didn't come because I woke up on the bed that afternoon. I was really excited and passionate about my feelings towards the government or speaking towards certain things. That has nothing to do with it. In fact, if I had a personal preference, I would have I would have been a completely different field at this point. I would be on a totally different playing field uh, with my family. I'd be completely out of this war zone, okay? But the Holy Spirit gave me a command to speak what was spoken, and it had to deal with what's coming. And there's a video on our YouTube channel called Let Those Who Have an Ear Hear. It's real simple. And if you watch that video, it has to deal with places of refuge that God is setting aside during this season of total calamity. And God is setting aside places of refuge. And it was very specific instructions that were given about these places of refuge that are in that video. You can watch that video. It will explain to you everything you need to know in relationship to what you need to prepare for, but you need to start preparing. If you have resources left, be Holy Ghost led and invest in life. If you have not gotten a word of protection over your life, seek a word of protection. Seek a word. Lord, that you are protected, set apart, every need you have is met. If God has been blessing you, if you've gotten a word that your place is a place of refuge, praise the Lord. Then be prepared 
that men and women will be drawn to your place of refuge, if that be the church facility or whether that be your personal house. Wherever that place of refuge is, you do not want to leave the territorial boundary of that place of refuge. While you are on the territorial boundary of that place of refuge, you will be protected. If you are not on the territorial boundary of that place of refuge, you are not protected even if you are a saint of God and a Bible-believing Christian unless you have been given a very specific word over your life and it has not come to pass yet unless you have gotten a prophetic word and you have received a physical word and it has not come Come to pass, that is the only way that you will be able to survive that season. If you are not on a place of refuge, you will have to stand on that word and you are going to have to operate absolutely everything in love, in Christ's love. That means when I when I say Christ's love, we're not talking about well, I've got the love of Christ. No, we gotta go back to the book and it says love, it's it's patient, it's kind, it's not self seeking, it doesn't dishonor others, it's not proud, okay, it keeps no records of wrongs, it's not easily angered, it always hopes, it always trusts, it always protects, it has forbearance kindness, goodness, and self-control, right? That's 1 Corinthians 13, and that's uh, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, with the fruits of the Spirit. That means keeping no records of wrong. That means you can't say you can have love. You've got to have a heart of love where you can look at your enemy in their face and say, and they have a threat against you, and you have so much of Christ's love inside of you that you have adopted a heart that can literally look them directly in their eyes and say with Holy Ghost peace, I will let you kill me if it in any way, shape, or form turns your heart so that you can understand to have a selfless love, and it brings you closer to Jesus Christ. I will literally let you kill me. I love you that much. That you are so giving to your enemies that you adopt that attitude, not that you'll fight, because you are militarily outgunned. You can't even fight against autonomous drones. And it doesn't matter if you have bought AR-15s with every type of ammunition there is. You can buy every type of gun possible. You cannot fight against that enemy. You can't. You can't fight against it. There's no way. You can't shoot fast enough, and you can't even reload your gun fast enough to shoot down that enemy. It is totally and completely outmaneuvered. The Second Amendment does not award you the proper protection uh, to defend against that type of, of, of a conventional overwhelming enemy. It is, a conventional, uh, it is a conventional weapon, but it is so overwhelming in its capabilities as a conventional weapon that there's no way, possibility as a Christian, unless you have been given the word and you are at the place of refuge, that that will end up happening. And then it gets even better, because during that season of hardship, and you'll know when to go, the Holy Spirit has revealed it. You'll know when to go to the places of refuge because the Holy Spirit has revealed it. It says when, uh, when, when you see President Obama, when you see him being moved to a secured location that is outside of the White House, you will know right then and there that's when you, that's when you need to make your way to the uh, places of refuge because immediately after that, all hell is about to break loose here in the United States. That's prophetic. And you'll know when to evacuate the places of refuge because it will be done at the end of a very specific time period that has to deal with 1,260 days and two witnesses dying in Israel. And when those two, when the two witnesses die in Israel, when their dead bodies hit the ground, that's when you're going to need to evacuate your places of refuge. And you're not going to take your phones. You're going to have to go to the wilderness. You'll have to go to the wilderness. And not only will you have to go to the wilderness, you're going to have to be hunting and fishing animals that by this time, most of them have all gone extinct. Because every other good old boy that was starving to death will have been hunting them. So you need to be fully prepared in every capacity, because then that machine intelligence is going to try to draw you out. That's why it has a mark. That's why. You can't buy, sell, or trade. So I have to train my son. 
I have to train my children during children's ministry, how to, not only teaching them the most state-of-the-art technically, uh, uh, technologically advanced uh, equipment on the planet Earth. Not only do I have to teach them that, but then in addition to that, I also have to teach them how to evade that enemy. Because when you go, you're not going to be able to take anything with you that has anything that can emit a transmission frequency over the electromagnetic spectrum. That means you keep your radios at home. That means you keep your walkie-talkies at home. You keep your ham radios at home. You're going to keep your cell phones at home. You're going to keep your laptops. You're not going to bring that with you. Because the military machine intelligence, get this, can isolate the frequencies that are emitted from the electromagnetic spectrum and triangulate your position. And then you'll see, you'll look off in the distance, and you look at that locust swarm that's on our, on our website, and then begin to imagine that you're going to see thousands upon thousands that are going to look like a flock of birds on the horizon. And then you're going to see thousands of them, legions, and they're going to look like a big flock of birds. They're going to be like, what is that? And that is a swarm. That's a swarm of autonomous machines sent to kill you and your family and your children. So you're not going to be able to bring cell phones with you. You're going to have to go low-tech in a high-tech world. And you're not even going to be able to buy, sell, or barter, which means you're going to have to already be self-sufficient at that time. So get your mucking cows now, because it doesn't matter if you had a gold brick that granddaddy gave you. You're not going to be able to go down to your neighbor and say, I'd like to trade you this gold brick for a dozen of eggs because my children are starving. You're not even going to be able to do that. Because remember, you can't buy, sell, or trade without that economic mark to connect you to that system. So that means you're going to, at that time, have to be totally self-sufficient because you're not going to go to the store. You're not going to run down to the Costco. You're not going to run down to the Walmart. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be living off the blessing that God has given you. And do not think for one second this is not going to happen within your lifetimes. It's going to happen in your lifetime right now. Biblical prophecy is literally being fulfilled like textbook, like literally by the textbook, okay, uh, right now before our very eyes. And brothers and sisters, that word that was given to you on March the 19th, it's been Holy Ghost confirmed. Those that like confirmations in the spirit, well, there's confirmations after that word was given, so supernatural in nature. God had me, he led me out on that Saturday. I got testimony. The word was given on Tuesday. That Friday, God gave me a word for one individual that, that had a place of refuge. They received it, uh, that, that that was a confirmation. And then on Saturday, God led me out into the middle of the forest. He said, go out to this river that's in the middle of the forest, that if, you car, if your car broke down, you better have your walking shoes on because you're going to be walking a day back to civilization. It's that far out in the forest. He said, go there. You're going to meet a woman named Claudine, and you're going to tell her this message about her house being a place of refuge. And literally, I go right to the exact location. I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I park exactly where he tells me to park. And in 10 minutes later, guess who comes out of the woods? The woman, Claudine. And I have to announce myself, just like the Holy Spirit said. I, I got out of my truck, and I knelt. I said, I'm, my, my name is Joshua King of Greenwood. I said, are you Claudine? She said, yes. I said, I said, the Holy Ghost has got a word for you. And then relayed the message about her place being a place of refuge. And then nobody even would believe me. If I told them the second story, what happened then on Sunday, because then on Sunday, God led me back into town to go to two brothers and give them a word about that place of refuge, that that's where they needed to go, and these brothers aren't even Christians. And then they received the word, and then now one of the brothers is getting trained up as an apostolic brother. <laughs> And he's going through he's going through ministry now. Now every every week now the guy has me teaching him in discipleship training. Look how God works. So 
So that word was confirmed. And then in that word, it was given, this was March the 19th, that there will be a war in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia being a major player. And guess what happened on March the 24th? Only just a few days after that, there was a war started in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia against Yemen. And they created a United Arab League defense force. And then there was another word that was given about Russia repositioning its forces in the Middle East. Guess what's happening right this very second? Russia is repositioning its military forces to the Middle East. In fact, next week, Russia and China, for the very first time in human history, are now having a joint military naval drill in the uh, Middle East. Very first time in human history. That's on top of the fact that yesterday China rolled up two of their destroyers into the Black Sea to help out their buddies in Russia. Because just in case the Saints didn't get this yet, China and Russia have formed a secret military alliance. They're, they're, they're both in bed together. Militarily. The worst fears in America is right there. I've had prophetic dreams and visions of Russia and China attacking the mainland of the United States of America together. Folks, this isn't a normal day. If you think that you're going around on your daily business and you think, life is just going to be the same thing, this, this is going to be the same exact way it's always been forever, that is not the case in any way, shape, or form. You need to prepare yourself for war. You need to prepare yourself as saints to evade the enemy. You need to prepare yourselves to go to places of refuge that God sets aside as safe havens. You need to be prepared that if your place is not a place of refuge, that you get your body and you get your family onto that place of refuge. And when you approach that place of refuge, you need to make sure that you approach it with peace and with love in your heart that you are loving and you are mutually edifying the body during that time. Be prepared to work with other saints together, and then be prepared to completely and totally disconnect yourself from every single solitary electronic device that there is. And I'm saying this in an electronic world. Because everything, every single solitary thing that you say Every single strategic word, every single solitary military type of strategic thing that can help the body, it is going into a machine and you cannot say anything. It is so important that God, during this season, won't even allow me. It's going to have to be person to person. We can't email each other locations because if we email each other locations about places of refuge, guess what will end up happening? The enemy will know everywhere where that location is. And if that location is compromised, then the enemy will immediately make that a target, just like they're making every single other thing a target right now. This is not a fun day. This is not. This is not a day that we go back and rejoice and say, oh, man, this is the best of times. This is not the best of times for the church. This is a time when the church needs to take this with deadly seriousness. They need to receive it. It's not every day that you hear prophets of God. You go to, we go to TV and you, 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 you hear a lot of prophets and they'll say, they say things in generalities. Most, most prophets of God that you hear don't talk about Russia repositioning military forces before it happens and then it actually happens after the fact and there's physical proof of it that the word was physically given, and then it physically happened. That doesn't happen every day. That's because you need to know that the word and the spirit of God is being spoken to you. So you don't have to look at me as a man, as a flawed man. Don't ever look at me as, I'm, as if I'm qualified, if anything, on religious, because Lord have mercy, this would be, this my mom, I as well call this from the empowerment service, the church will be unqualified, Okay. Because we're all sinners. We all, we all screw up. But that you heard this message because it was spoken in the name of the Lord. And it wasn't meant to scare you. It was meant to give you instruction so that you can survive that incident. And that you're not caught off guard.
Lord and not in the middle of a storm going, oh, my gosh, God, I thought that you loved me. Why are you allowing this to happen to me and my family? And then go back and said, look, the Lord gave you a word of instruction to go to that place. But if you don't, you can expect not only hardship and enslavement, but you can ex- expect to physically be killed and murdered. That you can expect that. And this isn't calling you to get in your flesh and go, I have to defend myself, because you can't defend yourself now. You can't defend yourself. You cannot. It is impossible. You cannot defend yourself against this enemy. You can't outsmart it. You cannot. Whoever man or whether the machine intelligence will itself, doesn't matter. It will happen. And you can't fight that enemy. So you're going to have to evade, and you're going to have to be very, very wise and have everything rooted in love and listen intently to the Holy Spirit. Saints, this is a word that, you know, I'd rather be talking about a million different things. There's like a million different things I'd like to be talking about. I'd rather rather be talking about the new Star Wars trailer than talking about this, for crying out loud. But this... This is one of those things that simply cannot be avoided. And you cannot be under the impression that your life is just going to be the same. Because it's not. This country is about to be divided because of the gay marriage ruling that's about to take place. It's about to be divided on that front. And the institutional guys and the real religious spirit guys, those, the religious spirit guys, those are the people that – the folks that have a religious spirit, they're going to be the first ones to die. They're going to be the ones to pick up arms because they're promoting a spirit of false righteousness. That's what they're doing. They promote a spirit of false righteousness, this false righteous indignation that because it's so evil that it has a right to do what they're about to do, they're going to be the first ones to be killed. In fact, they're going to be the easiest ones to be killed. In fact, they're going to be the ones for why the machine will end up trying to target you and kill you. Because they're scared. They're scared of ISIS. They're scared of the government. They're scared of absolutely everything. They have very little intelligence to understand complex things. And then when it's presented to them, they say, well, I can't understand that. But they do understand uh, uh, what they think is uh, 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 righteous indignation. And that is not the same kind of righteous indignation that Jesus displayed in his house that he had a right to display because he is the one true God, the Lord commander of the armies of heaven. And and, and and, and that temple and the folks that were in that temple ought to be happy that that's all he did because his military capabilities far exceed turning over a table. They far exceed turning over a table. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. He is so incomprehensibly powerful. But he loves us enough to give us this heart of love and give us this type of instruction. So don't pull out righteous indignation. Don't get freaked out when, they, when gay marriage starts becoming the law of the land and everybody starts celebrating that it's the new way of history and everything else. Don't get all up in your flesh and don't get righteously indignant. Don't be speaking out of turn and don't be saying all these things because I'm going to tell you, you might as well save your breath because you've been given the truth. Because none of that stuff is going to matter very soon anyway because you're being hunted in every way possible. That's a part of the reason why I like defending freedom. I love that I like to defend freedom. They're like one of the old brothers out there that actually tries out to go out there and defend, you know, Christian freedoms. But there's reasons why they have to go out there and raise money everywhere now because the enemy's coming against them on so many different legal fronts that they're literally being bled financially right now in every way possible. Saints of God, if, if, if saints want to be serious about this, if they want to turn the tide, God gave a very specific way on how to stop this because he's not going to just allow overwhelming judgment to happen without there being some ram in the bush, okay, some way, just like the Ninevites, that even though sure and sure destruction was coming, that they could follow those rules. But the rules and the outlines that God had laid out in that March 19th uh, uh, prophetic word were pretty intense. They had to deal with the government completely and totally rescinding everything having to do with the church. Marriage licenses, 501c3, auditing the church, the Defense of Marriage Act, gender laws, gay marriage, marriage in general, it all had to go. 
that there would be a true separation. And they had to repent. And the President Obama had to repent. There was a very specific word about him. And him and his wife would only know. And it had to do with him relinquishing his place as the godhead of his household and giving it over to his wife, Michelle Obama. And talking about some woman in the White House named Valerie Jarrett. And how there was a spirit of manipulation, and God needed to get her counsel out of that, and, and how the President Obama needed to get her counsel out of that White House immediately. And he needed to repent. And folks, there's a way out. But there is an extremely high likelihood that, that, that that's not going to happen. But, hey, but God did get on the stipulation, so there's hope. There's hope. Everything in my spirit is indicative at this moment that it's not going to happen, and all this hell is going to break loose. And so we're having this phone call today. So, folks, if we want to get serious about it, if we want to get serious about it, church needs support. (laughs) Church needs support. Everybody, your fellow brothers need support, and we need to support each other. We better start adopting a behavior immediately that we walk in love and mutual edification Let me explain to you what that means, love and mutual edification. I'll give an example based on church freedom, okay? We're giving you $15,000 worth of what would normally cost you for a corporation sold for free. Well, see, that's value. I'm giving you a book that I wrote that took me two months to write with thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of research and going over phone calls with the federal government you wouldn't even want to have on a good day, okay, and and getting all that compiled for you to give it to you. That's value being given to you for free. So love and mutual edification is, is that when I give you something of value, guess what you do as a pastor in return? You give something of value back. It's not that you take because you think for some reason you're a pastor, that you're a beggar from Calcutta, and you want to take from somebody and not give anything back. No, that makes you an endless consumer. God didn't call you to be an endless consumer like a locust and just eat from everything and not give anything back. He called us to be an impartation. So love and mutual advocation is kind of like what you see over here where, where you go – where you're being given something of value that you didn't have to work for, that you didn't have to fight for, and that you didn't have to buy because there's going to be a day, God forbid – when Christian families are going to be starving to death because there's not going to be interstate commerce, all hell is breaking loose, the stock market has tanked, and they're going to be living in areas where there's not going to be enough life to sustain them, and they're going to go walk into that place, and they better be expectant that when they walk into that place, they carry that attitude that they're not only just going to go there to eat that food, but they're going to contribute And if they don't have it in their hearts to contribute in that way and in that heart of love, then you have to understand that's not kingdom order, and that won't be allowed on those places. Everybody is going to help pitch in. Everybody is going to come together as a body, just like it was in the book of Acts, but better. That no one counted anything as they had of their own. So that way, when the fellow brother is in need that you need help with, you'll help them, and you'll reciprocate. And see, we got to start doing that now. And I know it's not happening in the body of Christ because everybody who's listening to this is either a pastor or they're an up-and-coming pastor because that's all we email. And I'm going to tell you, out of all of the hundreds and hundreds of applications, I only got two of those pastors that actually volunteered to even help us. And we didn't even put big stipulations. We're just like, help us. Just like, like, like get other pastors to come to our website. We, we couldn't even get that. I pray, thank the Lord Jesus. That when I needed to go up to Salem, Oregon, when I needed to go up to Capitol, we said we get a brass tax minimum budget, and the church came through. Praise the Lord. But, folks, 
if I can't get pastors to volunteer to help us here, and this is your religious freedom, our church is fine. And look, government, they can't come against us. I could say vote for this person and vote for that person. Government can't do anything to me. But your churches, if you don't got it, they can. So, so we've got to adopt this mentality very quickly because I know for a fact we don't got it yet. You might have it. Fantastic. Then spread that to others. Get people to get that mindset because if you as a pastor can't get it, how can you expect your congregation to get it? And nobody who's a pastor listening to this phone call right now can tell me that you're being blessed with super overwhelming donations right now. I can't even get donations from pastors. And I know if I can't get donations from them, I know you ain't getting it from your congregations. No, we can all just quit fronting right now. And them prosperity boys, our prosperity boys that, that talk about kingdom God's going to do this and that, okay, that's, that may be good. That's fantastic. That may be fantastic. But you know something? There's only so many more parlor tricks that can be pulled out. This church, the world doesn't care to hear anything else like that. They want to see power. They want to see physical manifestation of God's power. And that is only going to come when we, as the men and women of the body of Christ, the leadership within the body, come correct in our hearts, and we start instituting that right now. This is a season where families need to come together. This is a season where divorce is not an option. This is a season where families, husbands and, husbands and wives that are separated need to come back together. This is a season where fathers that have children around the country, they need to gather their children up. They need to gather their sons, fathers and sons, and they need to teach their sons the ways of the Lord right now so that their sons will understand how to obey this enemy. This is a season where we need to come together in love and mutual edification and actually know what it means instead of just talking about it. Because either we're going to get serious and we're going to understand this, or we're going to walk around like a bunch of chickens with our head cut off and be led like sheep to the slaughterhouse. And I've got peace. I've got a word. I have protected nothing. Nothing in this world can destroy me until my mission is done. I know that for a fact. I stand on word. Nothing can. Nothing. Not a single thing. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I literally cannot die until I am done delivering my message. And until that day happens, nothing can touch me. And I walk with God. I can tell you I'm a friend of God. I have physically stood in his presence on more than one occasion. I have seen his face. I am a friend. He is my friend. I delight in him, and he grants me the desires of, of my heart. And I can tell you plainly that this having this love is right where we need to be right now in this moment, right now. And so I want to encourage the saints today. I want to encourage you to listen to the words of instruction. I want you to encourage you to heed those words of instruction. I want to, I want to encourage you to get your word. If you have not gotten your word yet of protection, I want you to ask the Lord to lead you to any places of, of refuge as, as it is necessary in your area in the event that God hasn't given you a word about your home or your church being a place of refuge. And I need you to be mindful and start gathering the elect together. Start gathering together and start gathering the saints together. Start warning the saints. Start preparing the saints. Invest in life. Invest in life. If God leads your church to get land, get land that has fertile soil. Get land that has abundance of water and fertile soil. Pray to the Lord specifically for that land. And then ask the Lord for overwhelming favor so that you can have life on that land, like cows and chickens. Because chickens lay eggs, and they're real cheap. And cows are real cheap. They just need grass, and they need some water. But boy, I'll tell you, they produce milk, and they produce a whole lot of meat. And one cow can end up producing between 1,200 to 2,000 pounds of meat. Gather yourself the wheat, oil, flour, things that create life, that can, that can feed people. Fill up your storehouses. That food will be worth more than diamonds and gold in the years ahead. 
it will be worth more than gold and diamonds. There will be people that will literally be willing to trade the titles to their properties just so that you can give them a few ounces of meat and food in that area. Because remember Esau, when a man is starving, he's willing to go ahead and sell his birthright for a bowl of soup. That's how desperate people get when they're starving. Just go back to Esau and Jacob in Genesis. That man was ready to sell his birthright for a bowl of soup. That's what starvation causes people to do. That's what starvation causes them to do to make a decision based on their circumstances. Now, you're wise. So as a wise investor, as a wise man or woman of God that wants to bring forth increase, heed the word of the Lord. Invest in life. Get your money out of stocks and bonds and invest in life. Because that life will be worth more than absolutely anything that you can have of a monetary cash or gold value. You can't eat gold, but you can eat organic life. So I speak over you. I speak protection over you, saints. I pray that you receive this word. I pray that you receive it. I pray that the saints agree with us for breakthrough. I agree. I pray that the saints will help us, be in agreement with us, that they'll help us, because God has a mission, and he's got a word that he wants to deliver, and it's not all about the corporation soul, and it needs to be given all over the country. And thank the Lord that the saints will help us, that provision would come into our ministry, because right now there's a lot that's needed. There's a lot that's needed, and thank the Lord for it. Now, thank the Lord for my word, and that he will produce no matter what. Supernaturally, he'll produce, but be in agreement with me. Be in agreement with me. And I speak protection over you, and I thank the Lord. And, Lord, I just speak a hedge of protection over you. I thank the Lord for placing this word inside the hearts of these men and women that are listening today. And, Father God, I thank you, Lord, for that word. I thank you, Lord, for the protection of that word. I thank you, Lord, that you assign and we come against any assignment of the enemy that would try to steal that word from their hearts today, Father God, that you will embed that word as precious treasure inside of them. And that, Father God, you will encourage them and remind them with ministering angels through your Holy Spirit. Father God of this word and they will stand on the power of this word and you will give them instruction you will give them instruction Father God and they will listen intently in the mighty mighty name of Jesus Lord I pray men and women of God that is literally all I wanted to say to you today that's the only thing that the Holy Ghost has led me to say I pray that it is well received I want to thank you for your time And uh, God bless you. I look forward to having uh, more of these conversations as long as the Holy Spirit allows me in the days ahead before he completely and totally disconnects me from the Internet. So until that day is happening, whatever time God can give me to speak to the saints, I'm uh, going to take advantage of it, and I'll I'll make the phone calls. Just heed the words, because these are words that I'd rather be in different things, talking about different subjects than this. This is not a normal, everyday word. Heed it, because it comes from him. It didn't come from me. God bless you and have a great weekend. Talk to you soon.